funding mechanism is concerned, you have about 30 minutes, please. Um, thank you very much uh, for the uh, opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please allow me to stand on existing protocol. Um, let me just start by saying that um, uh, the reason why we're here is to look at alternative ways of funding infrastructure because currently the way we are funding inf infrastructure, when you look at it, uh, even Lagos State is struggling. So we need to look at what we're really doing and what innovative ways we can uh, bring to the table to actually raise uh, revenue. So, you heard the minister say that most of, uh, most of, I mean, uh, most of uh, transportation in Lagos is by road, it's about 95%. And if I can just be a little bit partial towards Lagos State, let me just say that Lagos State will never build itself out of congestion. It's not possible. And so Lagos State has to find a sustainable way of moving people from one point to the other. And that's where the connectivity between roads, rail, water transportation, and cable car, if you want to throw that in the mix, comes into play. But the key question is, how do you fund these alternatives? Because they're very expensive, they're complex, and it requires expertise. And that's the real question. Now, I'm going to give two scenarios here, and then I'll then throw it open to the um, panel to then debate on what is happening, I mean, what we've gone through. We have an operator, and that's why we should look at the mix of local as well as international um, uh, investors. We need to bring international investors, whether we like it or not, uh, to play uh, in the space. But we have an operator, a private operator, who decided to run uh, one of our BLT lines. And so they gathered the inv I mean, investment from abroad in dollars, and then just as they bought the rolling stock and then they were about to operate, um, the Naira crashed. Remember that the investment they're doing uh, the revenue will come in Naira, but they have invested in dollars. Okay, so you can see that from the beginning, uh, that business is going to struggle. And one of the things I'm going to throw to, especially the banker, is how do we mitigate against such risk? Because it's happening everywhere. And that's why international investors would not come in to invest in Nigeria. Now, the second one is our rail line. Yes, Lagos State is building its rail line. The government is trying to invest. We're trying to get partners to actually partner with us. Um, however, we always say that government cannot do it alone. The question is, how do government raise capital to make sure that it has a skin in the game, in the game so that when investors come in, they do not invest maybe 100%. So you build your rail up to about 50% and then you let the investors take over. And there's one thing I want to throw on the table which a lot of people have not looked at. I have been looking at this problem for 10 years and nobody has done anything about it. So you build a rail line. I mean, you, 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 you create a corridor, you build a rail line, Everybody around that cor I mean, around the area, has a land or investment. Because you put a rail line there, your investment goes up by a hundred percent, and then the investors, I mean, the people that own land, etc., just walk away with that hundred percent increase. But government has invested in there. What are we doing to ensure that that hundred percent increase in value government gets, let's say, fifty percent, so that we can put it back? into uh, the infrastructure that we're developing. Nobody has looked at that. That's the question I'm putting on the table. So just to stop there so that I don't take, uh, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, take all the time in the world. I want to start with uh, the chairman, I mean, the uh, presenter. 
and to look at some of the scenarios I have put on the table. I know I've, I've seen what you presented. They're very good, but sometimes they're theoretical. I mean, they're very theoretical, and they can be difficult to implement. And I just give you an example. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I think I'll start from the last one, uh, where you give an in, in example of rail line and um, properties along that axis uh, are appreciated in value. And the idea is, how does government uh, have a skin in the game? Uh, and I think it's part of what I mentioned earlier, to say that one of the alternative uh, financing mechanisms that some climbs have adopted is the same example of rail line. So Nigeria, because we need to be very careful, and I think it's good to say things that are practicable. Now, the moment there is a plan for um, a rail line to be uh, developed, people who before had no reason to be there suddenly will go and put up things all in the name of trying to get uh, compensation. That in itself increases cost of doing business. However, you know, there's what you call the right of way that the government has already, uh, I believe for the rail line, the government has already uh, obtained. Either he's sitting with the Ministry of Transport or sitting with the Ministry of Aviation, he's sitting somewhere. Government has right of way. So one of the things that, uh, one of the strategy, which is what I call the um, infrastructure plus property approach, is that the land that is ceded to the concessionaire is valued pre the infrastructure development. So pre the appreciation that will come with the infrastructure development that the concessionaire will do. Now, once the concessioning has taken place, you've done construction, commercial operation has started, the value of the property definitely would have gone up. In some climes, they charge what you call property taxes. So there's a differential between what was ceded to the company, which is the bare land valued at, let's say, one billion, and once the concession or the construction has been completed with enhanced value to the associated uh, infrastructure, the property value goes up. Now, there's a, the government can charge, and in some instances, you know, we can talk better later on how it's done in different places, and that is something that, can be, that is practicable. Such, because the valid is a valid point, whereby I need to take a slice of this appreciation that has um, come to the investment that's, that's, that has been made. Okay. Thank you very much for that. And I think it's something that uh, NITT need to research into, because I think that's uh, where you look at uh, what's happening in the world, you look at Australia, etc. you look at Singapore, that's how they raise capital to develop they are really infrastructure or heavy infrastructure. So that's one alternative. So let me go to um, Mrs. Messi. So you've heard uh, what uh, the presenter, uh, I mean, you've listened to what he has presented. And uh, you know the challenges that we have in Nigeria in particular. What are we doing wrongly? Um, um, in terms of attracting investors to invest uh, in our infrastructure. Thank you, sir. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished, I'm standing on existing protocol. Just like um, the presenter has done wonderfully well in the, in the lecture, Will we all agree with me in this hall that transport infrastructure is quite a, an incorrect tax because of the funding requirements? It's very expensive. Not only that, the maintenance of it is another issue. Now, what are we not doing right, like Mr. Chairman of the session has asked? How do you explain the rail track? that are newly constructed, the standard gauge lines, that people are going there to vandalize them. How do we want government to operate? You know, because one thing that I'm so sure of is infrastructure today, about over 20 years ago, was better than the one we have today. Why? 
Because the Nigerian factor, the individual nature of man, that there is need for us to checkmate and you said, be the change you want to see. One thing that is so sure from the lecture and from what we all know is that government cannot do it alone. The resources are no more there. The oil revenue that we had around 20, before, 20, before 1999, as of today, is no more like that. And these dwindling resources has adversely affected, we have, at the point we say we have oil boom, but the resources from that oil did not give us a commensurate infrastructure. Now that we are trying to do it right, there have so, been so many questions, I know my minister has spoken, that about rail, that why are we going to re repairing the standard in the narrow gauge, in, 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 in Paripasu with the standard gauge line. What we are saying is the narrow gauge has been there before now, and has served this country well. And those times, the growth rate is over 34% growth rate. Now today, we can't boast of 8% growth rate. Why? Because infrastructure is the main bane of economic, develop, economic growth and development of any nation in the world. And now, infrastructure is the lifeline of why we are here. It is what we need to move people, to move goods, to increase production, consumption, and let the goods get to their targeted beneficiaries. Now we have different modes of transportation that the investment is quite expensive. What happened in Lagos when there was this NSAS or something? See what happened, they went to, to destroy structures that will take us years to recover back. All these things are things that discourages investment, attracting investors into infrastructure provisions. Now as government, government has known that they cannot do it alone. And that was why government disengaged from, they tried to provide the enabling environment. And the, the clarion call now is private, public-private partnership, depending on the terms of agreement. And that is why government, most times now, what we do, we are looking for investors in rail, in road, and when these infrastructures are there along the rail corridors, along the road corridors, these are things that will draw people out of poverty. There was a time that there was toll in this country, and those tolls serve as a security for a driver that is coming, maybe from Lagos to Kano, for example. Today, they removed those stores due, due to policies because they said it was corrupt, they were not remitting, and it was uh, enriching some few individuals. But that was not, what about the security implications? That today, if your vehicle breaks down, not in the city, it's a problem along all the corridors line. The, the economic activities that were there fizzled into nothing, and those corridors now turned out to become insecurity traps for us, and even our neighbors are taking advantage of that. So when you look at it, some will say, why is government providing the Maradi rail line, for example? We are forgetting the economic implication, attracting, so that rather than going, the, the, the goods is messed for Nigeria, it is, they will pass through Ghana, pass through Nigeria, and then they are targeting us. At the end of the day, we are saying, if we don't put our house in order, there is no way that we'll be able to have, and the way people are very destructive, it is need for us to heighten the awareness campaign that the money we are destroying belongs to Nigerians. It is not for the president. It is not for anybody in government. But it's the, the resources of this nation belongs to us. And it is our duty, collective responsibility, to guide it jealously, to ask questions, and also to market it together. If we must be able to come out of the wood and move faster on a fast lane, there is need, you know, I've had so many, the, the cross-cutting issue, the inter, intermodal connectivity, inter everything, concessionists that the ASIAS has told us the advantages of opportunities, it makes them bank cable projects. Now government needs to provide the regulatory framework, the, the enabling environment, the policies Absolutely. that will secure investment. Oh, of thank you very much. That will attract investment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So basically, government has more to do in uh, trying to ensure that uh, uh, we protect invest, uh, the investment of uh, people that come in to invest. Okay. So um, in Lagos, and I'm coming to you, Prof. Um, so uh, some time ago, uh, you've heard of the Lekki Toll Road, uh, the LCC project. And uh, we did the appraisal. Um, we made sure that, I mean, we had a bankable project, and then we... Um, 
went into implementation. And um, uh, after a couple of years, you know what happened. So is there a problem in the way we appraise projects, uh, in particular, I mean, uh, in particularly in Nigeria? Um, do we need to do more? And um, I mean, what, what's wrong with the appraisal system in Nigeria right now that makes uh, PPP? Because there are not many successful PPP projects in um, Nigeria, if I can put it correctly. So, um, if you could just take that up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, the presenter, for a beautiful seminar synthesis of uh, financial mechanism for transport uh, infrastructure development. Uh, I want to take it from the reverse angle, starting with uh, perhaps what have we not been doing um, in this country, why um, funds have not been adequately ingested into uh, transport infrastructure in Nigeria. Um, one of the major problems from the synthesis of the presenter is that we have not adequately harnessed uh, the two main sources which he outlined. And I want to be uh, particular about uh, commercial banks, um, non-bank financial institutions. Perhaps one of the main reasons why they've not been doing that is because uh, of um, interest rate. The interest rate is so high that banks, to the best of my knowledge, will want short-term investments that will yield quick returns. And we all know that transport infrastructures are long-term investments requiring huge capital, you know, outlay. And as a result of that, banks, uh, financial institutions have not been forthcoming. And that is one of the reasons why we are where we are today. Indeed, looking at uh, the constraints, you agree with me that the commercial banks and financial institutions have not taken advantage of uh, the idea of consortium of banks coming together, knowing fully well that banks, a, a particular bank may not be able to handle a project, for example, a real uh, transport projects. So what has been the you know, stumbling block preventing our financial institutions from coming together as a consortium in uh, developing transport uh, infrastructure. I want the presenter to take that back home and perhaps ponder on it and come up with workable solutions as to how we can move the transport industry forward. Now, coming back to the Lekki, the example of the Lekki uh, project which you cited. Very often, these projects are, as we know, capital intensive. And every investor wants to recoup his investments. The greatest problem is identifying the risk. The risk involved. Most transport infrastructure projects very often, the experience has shown that sometimes they you know, look at the social implications more than the risk involved. And apart from the risk, I also noted obligations and appropriate durations for the project finance. The example in Lagos, I'm not too conversant with the 
the financial details of the project. But no investor will want his investment to be demolished and burnt down, especially where insurance, you know, companies might not uh, insure uh, the entire project to the fullest, as it were. So what is required is, you know, the financial institution is all encompassing. Both those that actually ingest the funds and those that will manage, and even those that will, will ensure the risk involved in the project. All these issues have to be taken into consideration when developing transport uh, infrastructures. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. So, um, just another example of how we're trying to complete uh, the blue line and uh, red line um, in Lagos. Uh, and uh, we are promising uh, the people of Lagos State that will complete it by the, second, um, by the fourth quarter of 2022. So, there was a dialogue with uh, CNN, I mean CBN, sorry, CBN, uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria. And uh, these are some of the innovative ways that we need to look at. Uh, so we approached them and uh, we asked whether we could, uh, I mean, they could um, raise some capital for us to actually complete the rail line at single digit interest rate. And so they went away and then they came up with a scheme called the differentiated cash reserve ratio, uh, which some of you might be familiar with. And uh, with that innovation, uh, they came up with a scheme where uh, with the amount of money that we borrow, we'll pay 5% interest rate in the first year, and then the, the, the rest of the uh, 10 of the uh, project it, uh, will pay 9%. So it's a very creative way of structuring the project, and, and I think that a lot of us should look at that. And that's one um, way of developing complex projects. But my question uh, to the presenter uh, would be, is that model sustainable if you, I mean, I don't know whether you understand the way it works. Is it sustainable in the future? It, it will be difficult, let me be honest with you, for my, uh, I think, uh, in terms of commercial banks, you can't blame them uh, to when they come out with interest rates that are high, uh, essentially because they have costs. Um, they are not the CBN. They cannot, they don't have they don't have the state behind them. It is your fund and my fund that they have that they can lend. So I put my money in there, you put your money in there, in a current account, savings account. That is, what, that is a collection of that pool they make available in creating risk assets, in giving loan, to, giving loan to us. So there's a spread that they make. Now, the discussion could be discussions with CBN and uh, policymakers in trying to regulate. Maybe there's a way they can you know, help to minimize you know, this spread such that it becomes fairly, uh, fairly affordable. But they have a risk profile. And again, there's no blanket. I can be a bank. I give loan to you, sir, at maybe 15%. I may give to uh, Madame over there at 18%. If the risk, uh, <laughs> the risk profiling is different. So there are ways, you know, um, the commercial banks are, they are trying their best within which they can finance infrastructure. I'll give an example. Uh, we used to, in my former employment, um, that we were supporting a, a project. Somebody was trying to do um, a power project in the in southeastern part of Nigeria. Now, what the commercial banks was able to do was to make funds available for the construction. Expensive, yes. However, post-construction, then that construction can be refinanced with maybe by uh, multilateral financial institution like AFDB, like World Bank. So everybody has a role to play. Construction might be one, two, three years after which the thing is refinanced, just like the differentiated uh, interest rate that CBN, you know, 5% here. But in this case, you have a higher interest rate and then refinanced at a lower rate. So they are very interesting. So, I mean, these are, these are creative ways in which you can 
actually fund complex projects like the rail project, especially at state level. So I would encourage every state to go in, I mean, to look into that and see whether it suits uh, their state. Because whether we like it or not, the gap is huge, and we have to look for sustainable ways of moving people. Because at this rate, at the rate at which we are going, especially in Lagos, um, I think it will be quicker. Uh, you get there faster if you walk than you drive your cars in some areas. And so we just have to um, look into all these creative ways. So one other example which I want you to respond to is that Lagos State is also talking to uh, multilateral agencies like, uh, well, we're, we're talking to the World Bank, uh, but current, I mean, at the moment we're talking to IFC where we're getting um, uh, a loan uh, in dollars, but we're going to pay back in Naira. So what that does is it takes that interest rate risk out of the equation. However, you've got to hedge that loan. How do you respond to, I mean, how do you respond to such, I mean, innovative funding? Um, it is sustainable also? Uh, actually, it, it, it looks sustainable to get uh, a loan in foreign currency and pay back in dollars. Although, uh, sorry, Naira, although the exchange rate issue is not in question here because we don't have the details. However, I want to say that uh, with every creditor's uh, interest, is to make profit. Every creditor. Because they will always want to recoup you know, their money back from their investments. Now, what is important, what is actually important, is that that investment, if the funds are injected into that project, and the project is viable. For example, transport infrastructures of all kinds may recoup its investment through track access charges, road tolls, or it could be even landing fees if it's at the airport, or dockage and port dues, mooring fees, etc., etc. The truth of the matter is that it is lucrative and that it can pay back the loans taken if channeled properly into the project as it was designed. Uh, there may be one or two challenges which I want to draw your attention to. Number one, most of these projects, at least just one that I'm aware of, did not carry out uh, transport demand analysis. Okay, let, let, me, let me just come in here. So, because I yes. said IFC. You know that before yes. IFC and World Bank give you money, oh. you know they will, they will do all the uh, duty. Yeah, all the like feasibility things. studies. So, this is, this is pure open. So, that's why you need experts that understand the market to come in and then put the whole straw, I mean, put the whole transaction together for you. Well, if, uh, if, if uh, a, yeah. a guarantee has been given in the agreement. Yeah, I mean, we signed the agreement. Yeah. Well, if a guarantee has been given, then, well, you could go for it. But mm -hmm. my fear is that in a situation where you take a loan of um, $100 million mm -hmm. and you have to pay back at the current exchange rate. So you're paying back the hundred million, million or whatever over yes. a period of time. Okay. But you know that the revenue that you're going to use to pay back is in Naira. Naira. So yes. obviously you pay a premium or whatever. There's an insurance, but obviously the bank takes that risk. But it does its calculation just to make sure that it minimizes that. The risk. problem there is with devaluation of the currency. If uh, that happens, so that's, that's factored in. Now. Yes. If that happens, what perhaps a thousand naira could do. If there's inflation, you know, all these economic indices has to be taken into consideration. Okay, I think it's something that everybody should have to look at. I mean, yes. so, 
Let's look so, at it. Sorry, it's, if it's, I, it's a if sustainable I, way forward. Yeah, if, so if I, I want her to respond, yes. and then I'm going to come to you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Just like I wanted to say that it will actually be a trap. Number one, because exchange rate differentials is paramount. There's no investor that will want to lose his money, no matter how you tie that agreement. You must not reach on that space of payment. For example, $100 million today, by 10 years' time, if you are using, let's say, 381 exchange rate, and by 10 years, you have not finished, or you renege, even if it's entered 11 years, you'll see that you will still pay back that money through one way or the other, either absorbed by, the, by government, meaning the insurance uh, backing that you have, but to say that an investor will lose his money, and the earlier we understand one thing, that they, they are not, investors want returns on their investment. And so, we must be able to fast track payments as at when due, based on, because most of the time we run into, oh, yes, no, we have signed. Whether you are paying with Naira, you are paying back that $100 million. Okay. And how you pay it can mm -hmm. be in Naira form, liquidity form, but you have to buy it. I'm going to let you respond. I understand what you mean. Maybe I should just put one or two more information. So okay. when I started, I said, so the IFC is giving Lagos State the loan to build that infrastructure. Operators will come and operate on that, I mean, on that corridor, okay. and then they'll pay, a, they'll pay an amount to government, which government now pays back to IFC. So, and that's why I said it's quite complex, but there's a lot of information that uh, people can gather from that and then look at it as a sustainable way of actually um, developing your infrastructure. So let me let you respond, and then I want to throw it open to... Um, yeah, uh, uh, thank you, comments. Mr. Moderator. Uh, like I said, there are so many things. We don't have one, one particular solution. So you've got to try different things. And I want to believe strongly. I've, I've engaged with the IFC before, and I, I respect and trust their judgment. Uh, without necessarily talking about the details of the, of the contract, I'm sure it, it would have something, they would have done the analysis. Uh, he mentioned hedging. Of course, there's a hedging cost. And I think one of the things that is also missing, uh, just to digress a little, is the issue of insurance. Uh, insurance in Nigeria is not as developed uh, as it should be. And I can, I don't know how many of us here that have our houses, and have our houses, your personal houses, and even insured. I mean, it would be, be surprising to see that everybody that owns houses here have their houses insured. Insurance happened because uh, you insure your cars because you know the police will stop you and ask for insurance. That's the reason. So it's not it's not it's not a culture that we've created. Now in developed countries, insurance companies are so big that they even own banks. Here, it is the banks that are big that own insurance companies. So it's a sector that needs to be tapped. So back to our hedging, uh, for IFC to have agreed to that kind of arrangement. There, there will be some hedging costs that will be borne, of course, by, uh, by legal states and to take care of that, which is like taking an insurance. Uh, should something happen, uh, this, will cover, this, will cover, this will cover this. So it's not as if uh, we shouldn't look at it from, oh, there's some analysis that has been done. They've checked it. They've looked at the possible uh, 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 volatility in the exchange rate, and that would dis define the premium that yeah. you will pay. So if I'm insuring my house, in an area where it's prone to fire, the insurance company is going to you know, charge me more because of the risk that this is going to happen. And that is why abroad, um, even insurance that you pay for vehicles, um, it's, if, you, if you've been driving for like 20 years, no accidents, your premium tends to come down because the perceived possibility of that risk crystallizing is low with you. However, with a young star of 17, 18 who is filled with energy and wants to uh, you save the world. It's driving all over the place. Insurance premium that it pays is high. But here we've pretty much have a flat rate. For the last 10 or 15 years that you've been driving, the premium remain. It doesn't take into account the risk profile. So there's so much that needs to be done uh, for investments to yeah. To, yeah. To, to to come in. Yeah. 